After watching Dirty Pop, the boy band scam on Netflix, there's some things that I wanna talk to you guys about from a licensed therapist's perspective. Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. If you are new here, hey, welcome. But if you are a returning subscriber, you already know how my review videos go. Full disclaimer, there will be spoilers in this video. So if you have not watched Dirty Pop, press pause on this, go on over to Netflix. It is only three episodes long. That means it's a limited series and then come back because we got some stuff to chat about in the comment section. Please let me know in the comments, what did you think about Dirty Pop? What did you think about Lou, Backstreet Boys, Old Town, NSYNC, the scams, the foolery, because we got some stuff that we are about to get into right now. I only have three things that I wanna to talk to you guys about today, but if you feel like I left something out or there was a different vantage point that you wanna share, make sure to put it in the comments. The first thing we have to talk about is preying on impressionable minds. It was very clear to me that NSYNC, The Backstreet Boys, LFO, Old Town, Aaron Carter, Take Five, and a whole bunch of other groups and individuals that I've never heard of, it was clear to me that these individuals were very, very young when exposed to Lou and his scheme. I'm talking about these men and women were fresh out of high school or very early in their 20s. And you know what I say, your brain isn't even fully developed until you're about 25 or 26 years old. So to think that these young boys and these young girls could make very informed decisions might be inaccurate. Because if you really think about it, he took full advantage of them to think that these teenagers or young adults had all of this talent, they can sing, they can dance, they were great, they had these dreams on the inside of them. And then to kind of exploit that and say, hey, I know some of you guys come from nothing, y'all been sleeping on couches, you don't have resources, you don't have money, you grew up from humble beginnings, let me expose you to a different life. I don't necessarily think that was a bad thing, but the way and how he did it was very manipulative and deceitful. And he wasn't even paying them either. They were doing all of this dancing and touring and traveling and doing all of these things and they will get pennies or just all oh, stay at my house because I have a mansion. Oh, no, 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 you need to be thoroughly compensated for all of your time, your energy, and your effort. For some reason, Lou Pearlman reminded me of the same guy that they showed on the Quiet On Set documentary, which was the documentary that was released about child stars on Nickelodeon and all of the things that they went through. Obviously, these are two different people and two different stories, but I felt like I seen the same white middle-aged man that was overweight. They just had different hair colors. So to prey on young people's minds when they're vulnerable, when they're excited about their career, when they're fresh in their prime, when they have all this gusto about life and they want to proceed and go all in and you take advantage of that, it's just not right. There was always something weird about them calling him Big Papa that didn't sit right in my spirit. I understand that a lot of them saw him as a father figure or felt like he supported them and rocked with them and provided for them and did all of the things that a father figure would do. But father figures don't lie. They don't deceive. They don't manipulate. They don't do things like that. They're supposed to really be there for you and to protect you from other people who might be trying to do some shady stuff in this business, not be the shady person. And when we look back on the footage that they showed and kind of like flashback to the 1990s and early 2000s when they would show video clips of all of these boy band members talking about their experience or talking about Lou, it sent chills down my spine a little bit. You can tell that their aspect was off. You can tell that their tone of voice was off. They weren't looking in the camera. Their body language wasn't showing me and giving me comfort. So even though they were saying, Lou is great, he's amazing. He's like my father figure. He was always there for me. Their body language was telling me otherwise. The second thing that we have to talk about is Lou being a con man. I know many people view him as a boy band mogul, and I'm not gonna take that from him. He did develop some hit makers. I wouldn't know personally, cause I didn't get into the old town and the LFOs and the other groups that they were talking about, but I was very much into NSYNC, okay? 
it's gonna be me. I was all into the Backstreet Boys. Tell me why. Like that was my jam, okay? But one thing that I do know was that he lied, he was deceitful, he was manipulative. And not only did he do that to the boy bands and the members and the people that he was managing, but he also lied and was deceitful and jacked up to family, to friends, to colleagues, to investors. They didn't know it at the time, but he was swindling all of them. When they said one of his friends was a Nazi, I said this alone would have been like, yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> All of this is a no thank you, get me out of this contract. But it just billowed out of control. Not only was he doing all of the investment fraud and taking people's money, even people that he knew, but he was also doing insurance fraud too. All of those blimps that he had are created and they just magically crashed one after the other around the same time frame and he got insurance claims and insurance money in the million. That wasn't an accident. He was purposely probably crashing those blimps so he can get the money so he can use that to leverage other things and pay back the money that he owed to other people, that he owed to BMG, that he owed to the Nazis, that he owed to all of these other people that was a front because he was being shady. Everybody was talking about transcontinental, transcon, transcon, and I am always um, what's the word? I can say I'm always more aware when I see an individual or an overarching corporation and they have all of these different subsets. I'm not saying all of the people's business structure who have that type of structure is illegal or doing some type of, you know, illegal activity, but I'm very aware of that. So if you got transcontinental and you got a pizza place, you got Chippendales, you got a station, you got a steakhouse, you got all of these different yogurt all of these different entities that they mention in this, this limited series that don't really go together. It's always just one off here, one off there. This doesn't have anything. And I'm just like, mm -mm, this is also a red flag. So to think that the people who worked for him or was close to him or was in his circle, not seeing those things is very odd. I know sometimes when you're in the thick of it, you don't acknowledge some of those red flags or even the yellow ones. You don't really see it crystal clear until it's over and you're far removed. We say hindsight is 2020 for a reason, but somebody should have been saying something is fishy. Something ain't right. Nobody had enough discernment or wherewithal or even just enough common sense to be honest with you to say, no, no, no. Where are you getting that money from? How are we able to travel on these jets? What, what's happening here? How do you have billions or even millions of dollars? No one was questioning where the influx of cash flow was coming from. But this man was a master forger. I mean, he was signing other people and his signature. He was forging other people's learner permit when they were trying to get their license and learn how to drive even back then. So all of these people should have known if you were doing shady business, <laughs> if when you were a teen or in your young adult years, you probably are going to travel and, you know, bring some of that energy into your adulthood. And we saw that with Lou because he was forging and handwriting and hand drawing signatures and stamps and all of these things. And I'm not going, I'm not going to lie. Like when they show snippets of it, I said, oh, this does look real and authentic, but that doesn't make it right. When you have scammed almost 2000 families families out of large sums of money. We're talking about $200,000, $300,000, people's life savings and their investing and their investments. It does something to you like none other. This documentary said this was the longest running Ponzi scheme in American history, period. So to think something like this was going on for 30 plus years is wild to me. One of my favorite people in this documentary was the attorney or the lawyer who won one of Lou's lawsuits. He got the settlement and the money, but he never paid his attorney and his attorney fee. That man was so pissed, but he was raw and he was authentic and not paying your debts and fees when somebody worked for you to help you to not get a court case, to not go to jail, for you not to pay that person is just messed up. I think the last thing that I wanna talk about before I go into my last point on part three is that everybody was kind of saying that he was asexual. People were saying like, uh, he didn't really like men or he also didn't really like women. I lived with him for seven plus years and I never seen him have women over or have any type of sexual relationships with someone or even a desire. But I thought it was so strange and so odd that his nurse, I believe her name was Tammy after he had his incident with like the cyst that ruptured and he was bleeding internally or something of that nature. 
he went around telling everybody that that was his girlfriend. And Tammy said, oh, no, 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 I didn't like him. He tried to kiss me. There was no chemistry there. I wasn't physically attracted to him. Like, it was a hard path for her. But I guess he wanted that persona or that facade of people saying that he's in a committed relationship. So how could he be a sexual predator? Or how could he be weird? Or how could he be a pedophile when he was in a committed relationship with Tammy, who was AKA his nurse? So I don't know if there was like some type of delusional <laughs> situation happening there because he was sending her letters and saying hey babe and you know all of these things and buy her Louis Vuitton and introduce her as his girlfriend when they're out and I'm wondering why she was still around and accepting this don't be claiming that we're in a relationship when I don't like you that's an absolute no part of me kind of sort of in a weird way felt like Tammy maybe liked him or maybe she was around because she thought that he was wealthy or financially secured and she wanted to kind of milk that situation because I would have ran so far away from him after incidents like that, especially one after the other. The third and last thing that I want to talk to you guys about is mental health. We've seen in this documentary that there was a person who died by suicide, which was Frankie, who happened to be very close with Lou. And to think that something of this nature with the investment scams and him taking thousands of dollars from different families to fund, you know, careers and pay off other debts and to do all of this weird shady business, to think that that did not impact not only lose mental health, but also the other people around him is absurd. They can deny it if they want to, but seeing someone live a lifestyle of lavish or what appeared to be lavish and have all of the things and then find out that that was a complete and utter lie, it will shatter your whole soul, especially for someone that you were close with or around very frequently. And I think a lot of these people either had or are finding a come to Jesus moment where it was just like, whoa, way back then I didn't realize all of the things that were happening. But when I look back on it now, when I think about it now, when y'all run the tapes back on me now, this was disgusting. Some say that Frankie died by suicide and others say that he was murdered. The first thought that I had when they said Frankie died by suicide, I said, are we sure Lou didn't have him murdered? <laughs> because it seemed like that was at the height where everything was starting to be exposed and Lou didn't know what the future was going to hold. So because Frankie was a little wishy-washy and he couldn't really control him or what he may do or say, he took a hit out on him and took his life. I just felt so bad for Frankie's mom. She seemed like a sweet lady who, you know, trusted her son and trusted Lou and gave up money. She was like a school teacher and gave up money for investments. And now she's out of all of that money and her son. But that alone should have been a red flag to everybody else. There were still people working for him, still people around him. That would have been another reason on top of having a Nazi friend, on top of lying and being shady, on top of doing all of, I would have been like, this, something ain't right over here. And it's interesting to me that a lot of people did not have that discernment. And if I'm being honest with you guys, when I started this documentary, or I will say the limited series, I thought that there was going to be not necessarily so much financial um, shadiness or abuse happening or claims, but I thought that it would be more so sexual, if I'm being honest with you. I was like, oh, this is quiet on set all over again, times 100. But to know and to hear that a lot of his close friends and people that work with him said that they had never seen him being inappropriate with any children, even though he may have said and touched people's arms or said, let me see your abs. I think those are very weird things to do and you should not be, you know, you should be respecting other people's space, their physical space and their body and what they want you to see or not see. I do feel like there are some underlying things that people weren't saying. I feel like there was some type of sexual abuse happening. Maybe it wasn't for some or with some of the men and women that were his clients in NSYNC or Bad Boys, not Bad Boys, Backstreet Boys or Old Town or any of those things. But I do feel like something shady was going on sexually with him that it felt like wasn't fully revealed. All of this stuff is coming out. If I was a part of NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, LFO, Old Town, and all of these different bands that were connected with him, even if it was 20, 30 years later, I feel like people would still associate me with all of the foolishness that he did. 
I feel like a lot of people would think like, maybe I knew about it. Maybe I was aware, maybe I was in on it. So all of those families who got screwed out of their money would try to come after me because they thought that I was in on it too. When that wasn't the case, they were just as innocent as those families. That part is those families are gonna be impacted for generations. Can you imagine being a mother and a father giving your life savings over to invest and find out that it was a scam that's impacting you. That's impacting probably multiple generations to come because that could have been a cushion for you and what you could have given to your children and passed down. So this is going to have a lasting impact far beyond just one generation. So my final thoughts on this is that everybody that was in this documentary and even the people that were not included in here but were attached to it, but they just didn't want to be involved, all y'all need to go to therapy. I know I say this probably for every single video, but there was so much trauma, financial trauma, mental, like there was just so much happening that needs to be unpacked. And it seems like even some of his friends and the people that were in this documentary had some new revelations or aha moments that they really haven't thought about until they sat down to record this limited series. My question is always, why now? Like. When I hear about stories like this and documentaries and series and things, of, and I'm just like, why now? Why is this being created now when I believe Lou passed away and died back in what, 2016, if I'm not mistaken? Feel free to correct me if that is, if that is wrong, but why didn't we have a limited series immediately or not too far after? Why do things have to wait so long, especially when he's passed away and we've seen all of the evidence and we've seen all of the things, why? Why now? One of the things that I thought that was different about this series that I have not seen done in any other series was their use of AI. I'm gonna call it AI, but they said that this was digitally altered. So those moments and those clips where we saw Lou speaking and sitting kind of like at a desk, that was like manufactured or digitally altered to make his lips be in sync with the words and all of that. Like, I thought that that was really unique and really cool. I've never seen that before. The sad part about this all is really how he died. People said that he was amazing, but he was dishonest. And so we've seen this dichotomy and we've seen the opposite of people describing that he was a jacked up, raggedy, ridiculous type of person with handling his things, but he was also a good friend. And I always talk about two things being able to coexist at the same time. So you can have someone who was dishonest and shady, but they were a good friend and they were um, nice and kind and things of that nature. And so I think it's hard for people to put positive labels on someone who has done some shady things. And they said that really nobody was claiming his body the first few days after he passed away. And it took a whole army of people calling around to figure out how they were gonna bring his body back to New York. And to this day, there was only five people at his funeral and he doesn't have a tombstone. And it was literally like a forgotten person. Unfortunately, this is what happens when you live a life that is dishonest. That whole saying, what is done in the dark comes to light is real. That saying, money is the root of all evil is real. The Bible talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. All of these things are real and it isn't a bad thing to be in the media or to have a great career or to want things but you have to make sure that you are centered, rooted and grounded. So when the money, the opportunity, the exposure, the, um, the leverage, the, the followers, the whatever comes your way, you're not going to ruin the bag, the opportunity or mishandle the people. I said it once and I'll say it again. I don't think groups really work. If we look at the history of groups, whether it's R&B, pop or whatever type of genre we're in, we see NSYNC, Backstreet Boys didn't work out. We see the Five Heartbeats and the Temptations didn't work out. We see Destiny Child, Troop didn't work out. We see all of these new edition and you know, all of these groups, Jagged Edge, none of these groups don't work whether you are male or female. So I hope moving in the future, we understand maybe that just ain't something that needs to be done. Nevertheless, thank you so much for taking time to watch another review video on my channel. Please feel free to put something in the comment section if you want to expand upon an idea or share a narrative that I did not or a perspective that I did not talk about. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you next time. Be blessed. Bye.